Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. There's a few people joining one by one, so I'm going to give them a little bit of time to do that. Uh, been very much looking forward to this webinar and talking to our good friends from MTech and uh, talking to them about the launch of Embrain, uh, which was launched, I think, just over maybe two weeks ago. Um, and talks very much about liberating the value of data in manufacturing. Uh, I will start by introducing myself. My name is Philip Stoughton. I write for Forbes, I write for Entrepreneur, and I've written for most of the publications in the electronic manufacturing space. Um, and spent the first half of my career in electronic manufacturing and the remainder of my career writing about it. It's a, it's a fascinating topic and one that's constantly evolving, but I actually think we're in one of the most exciting times the industry, the industry has seen. This year has been ridiculously challenging, but it's really, uh, I think we're in for a decade of huge innovation. So exciting, exciting times to be in manufacturing, I think. Um, some interesting challenges though, and I think over the last five or six years, we've talked a lot about digital transformation and we've talked about it being a, a game changer and a, very much a desirable and this whole in, industry 4.0 revolution. I think what we're seeing now is that moving from something that would be a nice to have to something that's absolutely essential. I think digital transformation, a smart factory and industry 4.0 strategy is absolutely table stakes for anybody in manufacturing, but particularly for companies uh, in the manufacture in the uh, manufacturing services space. Those that those that outsource um, or provide provide to companies that do outsource. That's partly because the industry is becoming more and more competitive, and I think you know the battle to be the largest has long passed. The battle to be the cheapest has long passed, and it really is all about being the smartest. I think those that transform will do well. Those that fail to transform risk becoming completely irrelevant and um, losing pace in the market. Uh, I think what's interesting when you look at this this discussion is the connection that you need to make between the performance that you have in the factory and the success you have in the business, the performance you have in the business. And I mean that in terms of financial data, but I also mean it in terms of being able to satisfy your customers, being able to serve more customers in more stringent and more challenging markets. It all has an impact. So there's a very close correlation between manufacturing performance and business performance. And we've seen some great examples of that. One of, them, one of them I'm going to mention in a short while. What's made this difficult, and I think why we've had this inertia over the last five, six, seven years that we've been talking about Industry 4.0, is that it's so big, it's so holistic, it can be overwhelming for a lot of manufacturers and they just don't know where to start. And the other element I see as a bit of a challenge is that people don't know where to find where to find the money in it. It's a big investment. It's maybe a complex and overwhelming investment, but you have to have a dividend from it. There has to be a clear div digital dividend and you have to be able to see where you're going to get that return on investment. What we've done over those five or six years is develop ways of collecting data. And I think a lot of the individual machine and equipment manufacturers have done a great job of providing data from their, from their systems, but that's very much collected in silos. And that's where we have some of, the, some of the issues. We need something that's much more holistic. And contextualizing data is the only way to deliver factory intelligence. If you have individual data and it's not in context on the factory floor, then it's very difficult to derive intelligence from it. And it's only when you have that intelligence that you're making better decisions, you're making faster decisions, and you're driving that aforementioned impact uh, on the financial performance of the business. So what I want to talk about today as we talk about the, uh, the introduction of, of Embrain is, is how we break down those silos and how we liberate that value and actually utilize it to have um, some benefit. I just wanted to give you an, as, a, an, as an example, I interviewed uh, the CEO of Note, Johannes Lind Wiesdam, 
uh, recently, and he actually took part in, a, in the last webinar we did in this um, series. And it was clear from discussion with him that their impressive results through the crisis were closely connected with their ability to systemize factory performance improvements, not just make those performance improvements, but actually put systems in place that would do that and would unlock the data available that they had on the factory floor. And their performance has been extraordinarily impressive in a very, very difficult year there. They increased their um, sales by 16%, their net profit grew by 31%, their operating margin grew to 7.7%, which in the EMS industry is, is enviable. And in the last two years since they've been undertaking this program, they've close to tripled their stock price. So impressive performance indeed, but performance that comes really from being very focused on those systemized approaches to factory factory performance improvements. So without taking the whole webinar myself, I want to introduce our two guests. Uh, our two guests today are CEO and CTO of MTech, Matthias Anderson and Tor Johnson. I'm going to ask them to give you a, a quick uh, introduction themselves. So Matthias, perhaps we can start with you. Sure. So I'm Matthias Anderson. I'm the, the founder of MTech. So first, I'm going to start by introducing MTech. So MTech Swedish company headquartered three hours north of, of Stockholm. Uh, we're all about simplifying manufacturing. So looking through what we're doing, we, we're developing software for digitalization and automation. And everything this comes from a long heritage from, from factory improvements for the last 20 years. So myself, I have 25 years in the, in the industry, uh, helping companies to, to improve. Um, I was part of doing neural networks and closed loop machine learning, Some some actually 25 years ago, what everyone is now talking about, we did way back when. So we at MTech is all about making manufacturing simple. So thank you, Phil. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> so um, I'm the CTO, Tord. Uh, I had my background more in, in on the, um, let's say, uh, electronic engineering side. I have a PhD in, in, in microelectronics where I, I did frequency synthesizers for, for uh, Wi-Fi systems, etc. But I quite early on in, in, my, in my career ended up in the EMS industry. And back then I, I used to help customers uh, develop their, their new products. So they will come to us and they would ask for, for support in, in introducing their, their product to the market uh, and, and selecting the right supply chain for that. So I, I supported them with the, the manufacturing technologies, supply chain setups, and, and, and of course, design for excellence or design for automation and design for manufacturing kind of issues that they would have. So I've been with MTIC now for almost 15 years, and, and um, we've been working on, on a global level together and, and helping a lot of the, the contract manufacturers and our other product owners. Uh, with their operational excellence. Uh, so traveling around different factories, different countries and, and supporting on, on different shop floors to do that. So try to connect the strategy from, from the, the, that they have and, and, and put that on the, you know, more on the executional on the operational level. So as part of that, we, I mean, we, we collected a lot of information during the years and we've seen a lot of different products that have been successful and maybe not so successful products. And what we did was, was that we tried to, to put that information together. So we put together a couple of, of uh, books around the subject where you can you know, look at the DFX and manufacturing excellence and how that correlates. So we, with that background, we, we sort of, of set up and, um, to look at, at Embrain that we're going to discuss a little bit more today. And, and then uh, I, for, for me, it's... it's uh, from my, my point of view, it, it's our way to sort of systemize and digitalize our knowledge, basically, uh, the main expertise in these areas, and try to put that uh, into the software and make it accessible to, to the users. So it, it's sort of the software that I always myself wanted to have while, while being out there and doing the, the groundwork on the shop floors. Yeah, it's that idea of having having the tool that would have been perfect for you, but it's also a synthesis of those decades of knowledge and those uh, decades of experience. So, so you're now releasing Embrain. I think it was released just under two weeks ago. You refer to it as a factory intelligence system with the am ambition of liberating the value of data in manufacturing. Matthias, tell me what you mean by liberating the 
um, the value of data because that data is currently locked away in various different places on the on the factory floor. Yeah, no. Basically, over the years, what I what I found on the shop floor is that most of the information is very scattered. It re resides in different types of systems all over over the factory floor so it runs everything from different spreadsheets into different databases and, and different system that just helps to collect and helps to over, to actually execute manufacturing so as, as Tor mentioned Embrain has been, been a brainchild for for some time now and, and basically as, as it puts it out digitizing the experience that we have how can we help customers create further uh, evolve the data models on the shop floor collect data that actually could be contextualized and Allowing customers to do their manufacturing execution is one part, uh, while providing really good process control, and at the end of the day, be able to virtualize the production flows. That's for us. That's very important, just in order to make sure that we all work with the right data. So we have in Embrain the capability to get provide real time information. We have something that we call the quality toolbox. We have the capability to contextualize information through different data model creators, and of course. As you, you started with, Phil, the, the obvious link from operational performance to the financial performance is, is very clear. So the whole purpose of Embrain is to be able to allow the customers to streamline manufacturing planning and control. And at the same time, which is extremely important, it will become even more important as we go along, uh, provide really good traceability features and functionalities because not only being able to track and trace a component, but my experience says that traceability is one of the strongest improvement tools there is. And being able to do that on every process, on every machine and every interaction is, is extremely crucial. Yeah, and you can only you can only improve what you can measure. So any yeah. any degree of traceability in a holistic way is and in a in a granular way is is absolutely essential. Matthias, you talk about this idea of liberating the value of data in manufacturing, and I think that's really important. How do you achieve that? How do you liberate that data? Because it, it's, it's been collected. We've almost, it almost feels like we've got too much data, um, but we need, to, we need to get value from it. Of course, and I, I, we're a strong believer that throwing a lot of unsupervised learning towards data is maybe not the best source. You need to contextualize it. Um, um, as, as I said before, information on the shop floor today is, is quite scattered and you have different silos of, of test systems, you have the SMT lines, everything is, is, has been connected for many, many years. But in order to get a, a full end-to-end -end overview of it, it's extremely important and at the same time being able to contextualize the information that you get there. So we believe that when you, when, when you start correlate the information, that's where the magic starts to happen. And, as we all know, doing improvement work, uh, it, improvement work has to be fact-based. It has to be contextualized and it has to be accurate. Otherwise you can't do improvement. You will just do continuous change. And as, as uh, with Tord's background as well, uh, looking through the, the possibilities to actually feed back information back to the product design using relevant information for them to work with. And their system on the market has been doing this for years as well. But being able to actually put that in a context uh, using traceability as one tool, using the, the control plan as, as one tool, and making sure that the designers gets the, 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 the correct information at the right, right point in time. We believe that's very, very important. Everyone then will work with the same type of data sets. So we have also, uh, from the perspective of, of the customers, each one on the shop floor, each one in the, in the company, they provide different types of value. And at the end of the day, being able to understand the customer, customer, we believe is, is, is of ex extreme importance. By the end of the day, that's where competition comes from. If you can compete and, and provide better value for your end customer, that's where business will, will flow. So I'll, I'll just hand over to you, George. Just take a good example of some of the data that we've been, been working with over the years. You know, of course, there, there are many data to choose from from that perspective, but, but I like to, to bring up one example that might be, you know, a typical one you know, from that perspective, if you're looking in the EMS industry and you have your SMT line. I mean, that's where you put most of your money when you do your investments and that kind of thing. And that's where you have a, a lot of 
data and, and machines that provide data. So you have your, your, your SMT line is filled with the screen printers and the SPIs and the, you know, the pick and place machines, of course, and you, you have your reflow ovens and your uh, automatic uh, optical inspection machines, maybe some test systems and et cetera that, that you, you provide into this system. And on each and every machine here, as we said earlier, you know, they provide a lot of good insight into that particular process. And, and learn a lot of data usually uh, that, that is sort of, of available to the to the operator and the engineering team for that specific process. But uh, if you walk up to a let's say an, an operator by the AOI station and sitting there and, and, and watching the the process and and, and keeping track track of, of that station and, and you ask that operator or engineer for that matter and that, what what is the the biggest problem today in in the screen printing area. And how would that affect your 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 capabilities that you have on on on, on your machine and your equipment? Uh, it is surprisingly often that you get uh, no, no no relevant response from that one because information, as you you started up here, uh, is siloed uh, in the way that it is presented and the way that it is gathered. So there is is uh, very little communication in between these different silos. And, but it doesn't stop, I mean, basically by, by the SMT line, because um, one, one benefit we have there is that the, it's uh, an automated process and we have a lot of information that comes in and out of that machinery. So I think that, that that's uh, one, one important part. But the other one is that you have a lot of manual process steps in most manufacturing sites today as well. You have your, you know, um, component preforming, for example, you have your manual assembly, of course, you have your... Um, Final assembly, packaging, etc. All of these I mean, are manual or, or more manual, perhaps, than the SMT line, at least, uh, process steps. And, and, and uh, as long as you have these manual operations, you will, of course, have operator dependencies and, and your quality levels will depend a little bit on trainings, etc. So it's also important to try to collect as much uh, information from those uh, manual process steps as well. And that can be done by digitalization of, of, of your manual processes. It doesn't necessarily have to be a machine. So I think that that's important to look at. <clears throat> but there is also, I mean, everybody sort of have the, the conceptual picture of the SMT line being very automated. And, and it is in many cases, in, in a big extent or to a large extent. But you also have a lot of manual processes feeding into that system. One such good example is the, the solder paste, for example. So the solar paste that you use when you do the screen printing, that, that is uh, stored in the fridge to, to, to uh, keep the shelf life longer. And uh, before using it, you should take it out of that fridge, put it up in the room temperature, let, let it um, be heated a little bit before using it. <clears throat> uh, this is the, mainly done by standard operating procedures today. So operators will go there with a certain uh, time frame before they should use it, bring out the new can and put it there for, for to rest before uh, putting it into production. In some cases, I mean, that, that, that point uh, will be delayed. So, so maybe the, the, the solar paste is a little bit cold. And then, then when you apply it onto your product and into your process, that will give a poor uh, processing uh, result. So the deposit will be bad. And of course, if you only look at the data, it will look like the screen printer has failed somehow. Uh, and maybe you would draw the wrong conclusions. But actually, it's, it's just cold solar paste that is the, your uh, root cause to this. So it's important to be able to correlate data and understand the relationship in between these data sets in order to make you know, the right decisions. And, and in, in many cases, for, for me, that's uh, sort of, of based in some kind of domain expertise. So you know what's related to what, and you have a certain understanding of this. Uh, it's not so easy to apply um, AI models or, or, or AI tools today to, to sort of, of extract that and understand that. So you have to be a little bit careful when, when you apply those. They are very efficient if you do it in, in the right context, um, but, but you have to be have the domain expertise to know when to use them and how to use them. And uh, it has always been the goal for, for me, at least, uh, to, to, to bring into Embrain our domain expertise mm. and you know, make that manufacturing knowledge somehow available to, to, the, to the software users. Uh, and, and that's always been been the case, and that's what we're driving uh, for. So, so that's some of the examples that and, and how correlation in between these data sets are are important to understand to to order in order to liberate the, the value of the data actually. Yeah, that correlation is huge, and uh, as you mentioned, it's having that deep domain knowledge in each of those areas and that vast experience in those each each of those areas 
but also understanding the big picture, that holistic idea of, of what's going to impact other processes. You know, you mentioned solder paste, that's going to impact uh, the oven, the thermal profiles, all kinds of other things. So you've got to be able to uh, make those connections. And if you are going to apply AI, you've got to, you've got to do that within the way you do that as well. Mm -hmm. um, one of the really important connections for me is, is again, chasing those dollars, show me the money. Um, how do we link that factory efficient to efficiency to financial efficiency, financial performance? How does that holistic approach actually impact on the not just the bottom line performance of the of the business, but the way it takes better care of its customers, the way it wins more business, the way it's able to grow. Matthias. Yeah, yeah no, and, and that's an interesting question. I've been working in 68 different countries uh, over, the, uh, over the world. And, and one thing that strikes me is that every site that we visit has their own set of KPI structures. There are some, some overarching ones that, that everyone's trying to use. OE is one for first pass yield, of course, work in progress and such. But <clears throat> Looking through it, of course, uh, every manufacturer is unique to start with, but we are trying to contextualize it as well. So we have an approach where we call the supply index, which is actually a combination of, of lead time, uh, delivery precision and inventory turnover, which on a very top level actually helps to, to showcase where issues actually correlates to. Of course, and, and then everything is then drilled down to specific parameters, but the interesting part is when you start seeing that if I have a long lead time in manufacturing, if I have a poor delivery position and I have a very low inventory turnover, lead times, of course, is in a direct effect of your flexibility, which is in turn its effect of your, your change over time and your, your efficiency rate and utilization rate. Your delivery position is, is a combination of factors such as the making sure that you have the, the uh, sourcing done in a proper way, you have the call-off procedures done in the right way. So I would say that uh, the financial performance is, of course, extremely linked to, to the performance of the different KPIs. And, and the key thing is to set the right data models to start collecting and making sure that you have that information more near real, real time in order to make the right decisions to, to correct them. Tord, would you like to add something to it? or? Yeah, sure. I mean, we can go back to, to the SMT line again. I mean, that, that's a good example, I think, for, for this one. I mean, uh, every single process there is very, you know, very well documented. And you have a lot of data there that can support your, your different KPIs, like, like yield or like uh, pickup rate, etc. You, know, you have a lot of these different things that, that are directly related to your, your financial performance as well. But I think if you're looking at any manufacturing flow, I mean, you have a starting point and you have a few, uh, you know, process steps in between, and then you have an, an, an out point again in the end, right? And looking from that end to end, the impact, that's what actually makes the money. So it's important again now and then to look at the correlation, right? So it's the correlation relationship in between all these things that are giving you the, the total output. It doesn't make sense to have a very, very good uh, you know, a uh, super efficient uh, process in the middle if everything uh, to the left and right of that process we, is not uh, as good, right? So <clears throat> I think yield is, is a good such example. You look at the yield in each and every single process step and you put them together, you get your first pass yield. And that's the sort of what gives you the money in, in, in the end, right? But <clears throat> in order to understand this, I mean, they, they, you need to have that traceability that we talked about earlier. And uh, Matthias, I think you, you had a good point there. It, it's, it's a very good improvement tool. So we try in Emory, try, we try to really provide a deep traceability level, uh, meaning not, not only components, because components is sort of, of uh, you know, it, it's a must have uh, right now. I mean, you need to have your, your traceability of your components and your, and your material that you're using but also looking at the, the traceability of processes. I mean, so you can actually tag your process data to a certain time frame or to a certain machine or an operator or a, uh, any, any important parameter relating to that process basically. So that you can later go back and you can do that traceability. Uh, and the same goes for, of course, for test results or, or manual quality inspections or, or, or operations. So uh, once you have that traceability, then, then you know, it's so much easier to understand the, 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 the cause and, and the, the effects of, of uh, what might, might you know, affect your, your, your output performance from a, both the you know, I mean, production point of view and quality point of view, and, and thereby also the financial performance. 
And you know, as I look back on, on when we have done all of these improvement projects, and you look into these different things, and you realize, uh, you know, at the end of the day, there is a lot of data there in the machines and in the equipments and so forth. But for for many of these teams that are actually working with the improvement parts, they have the issue that the data is is uh, somewhat hidden from them, right? They they have uh, problems extracting them, or or actually. Uh, problems maybe understanding exactly what the, that data is, is, is really representing. Um, so for many of the improvement teams, you don't have enough data. So you, 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 you pull out the data that you, you, you manage or you have time to pull out. And, and the, the rest of the, of the decisions you do are based more on the gut feeling and, and operator experience. So one of the design goals that we had with Amway was to try to, to remove that gut feeling and, 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 and look at it more from a you know data driven point of view so we have digitalized a number of these you know common quality kaizen tools that you all have been uh, probably familiar with uh, and and we have been able to to connect different data sets data models etc into those uh, you know quality tools and, and that supports the data driven decisions instead of the gut feeling uh, <laughs> decisions right but I think linking back to the financial performance from that point of view is, of course, it is good that you can reduce your costs, etc. But I think where you get most buck for the for the money is is where when you're when you're able to convert that information and and feed it back to your customers to, to help them get a better product. And this goes back to my days of you know the the DFX and the design for assembly and design for automation, etc. So so where you where you can where you can use this uh, data from the actual production processes and feed them back to your customers to let them have have uh, take benefit from that data. And and of course that gives you the customer satisfaction. It gives you these kind of things that are are fairly important for the stickiness, etc. Yeah, no, it's interesting. And I think, as you say, the magic starts to happen, not just when you connect everything in the factory, but when you actually go outside of those factory walls. It's like all of these machines are these wonderful musical musical instruments, but it's only when you have the whole orchestra playing at the same time that it sounds good. You don't want, you know, just the violins on their own. You need the, you need the whole thing uh, orchestrated properly. Uh, and then it all starts to make sense. Great insight into Embrain, guys. Thank you so much for that. Let's start to uh, explore a little bit in a, in a panel format some of the questions that, that I have and some of those that we're receiving from the audience. I'd encourage anybody in the audience to uh, type questions in the, in the Q&A window and we'll, we'll get to look at as many of those as we can. We've got about um, 15 minutes to do so. Um, one of the things I was curious about, Todd, is how do you, how do you see this this, these technology breakthroughs that we're having at the moment and this period of innovation um, driving technology in the next two or three years. When you look forward to a factory three years from now, what do you see? Well, that depends. Uh, of course, you know, you know, it's a big world out there and there are many different challenges here, but, but I think the ones that will uh, embrace the digitalization, optimization, they, they, will, they will move far here in, in that time frame. But there will also be, a, as we all know, there will be the ones that are, are not embracing this. And, and, and for those, of course, the factory floors will more or less look the same. Uh, for the ones embracing this, I mean, they, we have a, I think we have a sort of a bright future ahead of us. There is a lot of, of data there and, and a lot of data is already available. It's more of unlocking and correlating them that, that I think is, is the real missing part at the moment. Um, I'm also seeing that, that you know, the, the process steps that we might forget when talking about all the cool equipments and all the cool machinery that, that, that I like as well. You know, we, we sort of forget the, the manual processes out there. There, there are still a, a significant part of manufacturing. And, and I think the digitalization of those will be super important uh, to, to get the full value and to get the full uh, correlation. Mm -hmm. But then, I mean, of course, there will be technology things like I, I think 5G will support us in this, for example. I mean, there, there's an interesting part that with, with the private slices and, and, and the low latency part that I think can help. There is also, I mean, other different things. I think robotics is, is going to be uh, taking off, um, finding new solutions for that that maybe we have not been able to, to introduce into the EMS industry at least. Uh, there, there, there are different parts of this from, from a technology point of view that I think will, will support this. But the main thing is, of course, you mean keeping the right mindset and understanding how to correlate your, your data. And 
I believe in, in, in you know, uh, starting out and building your, your, your expertise, building your teams, and, and, and because there, are, there will always be people handling this. So, so, so that would be an important asset here also, the training and, and the understanding of, of the people on the shop floor using the data and, and, and trying to, to make, make the best out of it. Yeah. So I, I hope that everybody <laughs> will, will fall into the digitalization, optimization, uh, you know, fold and, 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 and go that way. But it's a big world and, and the supply chains are, are in, in some cases quite long and, and you need to change um, in many different countries, I think, as well and at the same time. So that the entire supply chain moves one step up the ladder uh, towards the, the, the end goal yeah. here. Yeah, yeah, and everybody's got to got to move it at their own pace. But I think there's a real desire for this digital transformation at the moment, and I, I feel in the market there's a real strong desire for that. And we've we've already talked about Note, for example, uh, as a company that's really embraced this and done really well as a result. And I'm seeing more and more examples of that, which kind of, you know, as a digital evangelist, it excites me, and I know it'll excite you too. Uh, Matthias, when you talk to your customers, does what what we feel as a vision of the future reflect what they're asking for? What are they What are they asking you for right now? Yeah, indeed, it does. And I would say now with the COVID situation, this uh, the request has has uh, gone up uh, manyfold. So, what the customer what what we feel the customer is asking for is being given the capability to do uh, process digitalization in a, in a in a modular and a flexible way. And in order to do that, they need to have simple API creators to, under, to really be able to connect different data streams and uh, uh, predefine APIs and such. So what the way that we approach is, as Tord is mentioning, is that there is always a human involved somewhere. And of course, we want people to, in order to, 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 to beat variation, you have to, to work with uh, uh, standard operating procedures to make sure that you can actually uh, create and deploy those uh, digitally and make sure that you can actually monitor and track the performance of them. Uh, traceability requirements, as I said before, is, is becoming more and more important for clients because at the end of the day, no one wants to be, be uh, struggling with liability and not being able to understand where things has gone wrong when, whenever they do. And if, if they do, uh, really quickly understand the root cause of why it happened. And, and our approach to that is, is to be able to digitize that entire work, to be able to connect the, the failure mode and effect analysis to the, to the production flow to, in order to create the control plan and, and all the way into the Ichikawa uh, root cause analysis. So that's, that's our approach. And, and we have an extremely interesting discussion where we are, are using Embrain already to feed different MES systems on the market. The customers are using it as a standalone system and uh, taking on a modular approach. So it is very interesting right now. Yeah, and I think that's fascinating what you say there when you mention uh, MES and you mention people using it as a standalone product or with, within uh, a, an existing ecosystem. Where do you see Embrain sitting in the, in the whole software ecosystem? Yeah, I got once I got a question from from uh, corporate representative of one of the major EMSs in the world, and he said, "Why would the world need another MES system?" And my response to that is that the world doesn't need another MES system. The world needs a system that can actually create value, that allows the user to continue evolve the models that that we can provide, and and because the only expertise there is is the customer, and as, no one knows uh, the manufacturing better than our customers. And, and with that, with respect to that, we are creating tools that allows the customer to further evolve their, their, their the data models. Because at the end of the day, if, if data is the new oil, we believe that the data model is the pump. So that's our approach to it. And, and being modular, you don't need everything. We, we, of course, we would wish to boil the ocean, but that's not the approach that we have. We do it step by step and we do it uh, piece by piece. And, and we have uh, customers that are using the planning tools together with the data connectivity that, that are using the standard operating procedures. Uh, and it's, uh, that's why we launched Embray now a couple of weeks ago, because we have uh, really good uh, examples from the market already using the system. Mm. So. Yeah, and I think the idea that they can they can kind of enter the um, the product at different points. You know, you can come in looking for a holistic approach, or you can come in looking for an answer to a specific question, 
um, and then maybe you 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 expand the operation of Embrain within that. And I I, I think it's really attractive that the uh, model allows you to do that. Starting to see some questions coming in from the audience, and there's a few questions taught about advanced analytics and the correlation between factory performance and product performance. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, no, it's it's hard for me to talk a little bit about that, but I'll I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> or a lot, whichever you prefer. Um, but I mean, it, it's a big question, of course, and 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 this is uh, it's it's a, it's a broad topic, and and, and I think. When looking at analytics in general, I, I would like to maybe look at it from, from another angle. I think it's looking at, at analytics, it's important to always ask you the question, why do I need this analytics? What should, it, what, what, should what question should I answer with it, so, so to speak? So in, in many cases for me as a technology guy, I like to do the analytics just because I can or because it will show me something cool, you know, but, but sometimes you need to step back and you need to look at why do we need to answer this question? What am I actually looking for? So I think the analytics should be used to, to answer relevant questions, right? So that you have an issue with, not only because, of, because you can, but because of just that. And that makes it possible to choose, choose the right tool, I think, as well, because in some cases, uh, analytic, uh, uh, most efficient analytics can be a, th a threshold value. I mean, that, that could be enough in many cases, but in, in, in some cases that will never be enough. You know, you need the, that advanced analytics, you need the AI models, you need different kind of neural networks et cetera, to, to solve your issue. But I think it's important to, to, to choose the right tool for the right analytics uh, performance, you know, so the, so, because it's not, it's not, it's not easy to apply AI and models in many ways, because you need you need the data, you need to to you know sort of uh, classify it, and you need you need to have a lot of background information before these systems can actually support you and help you in 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 a, in a logical way. So, I mean, in Embrain we we have done a lot. Of, our customers have done a lot of things which are pretty cool. I mean, they have done the, the classical one where you you know you can have a a bearing and you can look at, at it and you can look at the vibrations etc. and you can see when this uh, machine or equipment is about to fail. I mean, this is, is things that our customer use today. But we also have some other, I think, more interesting uh, parts here where we have actually been able to detect material deviations uh, on incoming material based on actually a robot's uh, placing, uh, placement performance. So by, by looking at deviations in, in the placement performance, we were actually able to track all the way down to a certain supplier uh, using the wrong uh, steel <laughs> in a certain uh, component. And th this is interesting because, I mean, a human would not have seen that, of course. Mm -hmm. So, and that, that, that was something that was hidden deep down in the data layers, not easy to detect and where you needed a more advanced analytics form, I would say. So, so, from with that aspect, it is, it's a broad question, but there, there are different pros and cons yeah. to using these kind of analytical tools. Yeah. But I think the other question is also interesting when you look at, at your, because that goes back to, to my, my old experience when, when trying to select a proper supply chain for your product. And, and that, that's a tricky question, of course, because, you know, uh, when, when designers design a product, they are, they are usually designing for, foremost for the function of the product. And so they should do what it should do, right? Mm. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of the other stuff, sort of, of how it's manufactured, et cetera, is it, not on the top list. But once it gets out there and you do your, your product implementation and then you try to put them down in the factory and you start looking at your supply chain, then th those questions become very important, maybe more important so than the function sometimes. But so from that perspective, if you're looking at product performance and factory performance, I think a well-designed product is not only designed for the functionality, but also for the manufacturing flow. So those that are able to keep that in mind, uh, you know, if you have a, in my mind, then a well-designed product, you can produce it uh, with production processes that are maybe have a larger variations in, the, in their performance, you know, a yeah. larger... Uh, so if you have a product that is really on the edge, on the, on, uh, that has to use a certain process and that process window has to be very, very narrow, that will some, somewhere down the line affect your, your possibility to scale that product. Yeah. So I think when designing your supplier strategy, it's very important to understand the limitations of your product.
Yeah. And, and that's where I think that that interaction comes to play. And, and of course, I mean, from a produ uh, producer point of view, you always want the best possible, um, you know, production flow, but yeah. you also want to be efficient, et cetera. So, so there's always a trade-off here, what, what customers want and what you can provide and, and good enough, I think, uh, or, you know, from, from that perspective here, it, it's a good, uh, good way of approaching that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's interesting, Todd, when you talk about that and it, plays back to what you mentioned earlier, which is closing that um, closing that loop back to design. And the more designers get to see what's going on on the factory floor with the product and the more information they get, the better they'll become and the more sophisticated they'll come and the more, the more they'll be able to look down the supply chain, look down the manufacturing process and say, hey, if we do this, it's gonna have that impact. And it, it might not reduce the yield, but it might substantially increase the price or slow down, you know, slow down the supply chain or something like that. You mentioned AI in there, and I'm curious about AI. We've got a couple of questions coming in, in terms of how AI is applied and the challenges um, in doing that. Is part of that use of AI the fact that there is so much data on the floor? It's so complex that you have to protect people from complexity and how careful do you have to be in how you implement AI in, in a in a complex manufacturing ecosystem? Mateus, I can see your Yeah, I have, I've had this discussion many times and, and, and as I mentioned before, I'm not a believer of the current status due to the sheer fact that we don't have production data for several years on products because products tends to be living shortly. Um, so we believe in, in reinforced learning and, and a supervised learning where we are able to, to actually maintain control over the data streams. And of course, one of the biggest issues with an AI model is when you get BIOS data or, or, or dirty data that actually con conflicts the entire purpose of it. So <clears throat> the key thing is to be able to provide tools to very simply contextualize the information. And here's a thing that we, we want to, our approach towards Embrain and to the manif simplifi simplification manufacturing is, uh, Traceability is, is one thing, uh, that's extremely important. That gives uh, contextualized process data. But in addition, when we can, are able to link that to standard operating procedures, control plans, failure mode and effect analysis, that's where we actually could be able to provide better value for, for, uh, uh, for the clients. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I believe in, in AI and in uh, where you can actually allow the operators and the engineers on the shop floor to participate in, in creating those data models and create those uh, short-term uh, short learning models. Yeah, and, and when, you, when you look at all that data and all that information, you talked earlier about it, how important it was that the right information is delivered to the right person. But Todd, it's also a little bit about delivering the right value to the right person. So you talk a little bit about how Embrain is going to benefit perhaps the different stakeholders within the business, the quality manager, the, the CFO, the, the different people in the organization. You know, as we, we, we are usually using these uh, fake personas for, for our customers uh, sort of organization, right? And, and, and that's one of the foundation we had when we tried to design Amrain in a manner that we could support each and every character here uh, or, or, you know, organizational character from that perspective and, and, and see how, what kind of tools, what kind of information would that, would that particular person or organization, part of the organization really need? So, but, but it is, it's of course a big question, but I think the main, you know, the main thing is of course, I mean, to bring up the, the, the information to, to the surface and be able to correlate them and, and see here. And, and what we can do here is, you know, quality information is, is perhaps the information that you would look at first to understand your process and your outputs and, and, and really see how can we improve that. And, and, the, and there's a, a you, we have the, what we call the quality toolbox for that kind of matter. And, and that will certainly help the, the quality team. But I think it, also the production engineering team and, and the, the maintenance teams, et cetera, because that is actually just a reflection of your equipment and, and your, your possibilities that you have. And, and of course that also reflects, you know, on, on your, 
if if you're not in, if you if you move one step up or away from from you know machines and equipments and you look at for example trainings and, and and competence matrices and these kind of things that is also something that we have have within the software so you can map up your your team and the competence that they have and and and, and for different in any level that the customer likes actually down down to if they are able to use that particular machine or not. And so, so, so there is, is a, a way to, to run your HR system on there and look at your training programs. And so, so that will help, help uh, both management, I think, but also the HR to, to understand where they are uh, with, with their, <coughs> with their uh, competence uh, from, from different people in the organization. Uh, of course, financial information uh, is also possible to 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 find here, and, and that's what we've been discussing earlier here on, on how how we connect that. that. Um, of course, it, it might not be super obvious how to connect that directly into sales. Maybe Matthias, you want to add something about that one from the sales perspective? No, and, uh, and specifically so to understand the uh, one of the things that we're, we're we have is the feature to understand how much value creation has happened at every step to to support the clients to do uh, post uh, calculations or products and production runs. That's one part that we're, we're we are evolving, and there's a lot of things to understand where once again where value is created. That's the point that we're we're, we're having. So, yeah, and I. One of the things I think is really important there is that you talked about different users having different requirements. Those requirements will evolve. They're not all going to be there at installation. So I think when you look at a product like this, and I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that, it's essential that, first of all, deployment is as straightforward as it can be. But secondly, that the product can evolve with my needs as a business. So if I have you know, changing requirements, I need to know that the product's going to evolve with me to reflect those. Can you talk a little bit to that, Matthias? Yeah, sure. And, and this is, once again, this is the aim that we have is mBrain is completely modular. You don't need everything at the same time. We've received feedback from customers saying that they really like the approach because we are kind of guiding them on their digital transformation journey. So mm -hmm. you know, we already have functions that are ready for their next step being that they start with a production planning or they start with a quality toolbox or what have you. And I think that is, a, for us, it's a great importance to, to always stay relevant to the client. And it's also in addition to the client's client. We, we believe that we have a position to fill there. Yeah, and I think it's essential when you look at that within the whole ecosystem that if they have got existing products, Embrain has to play nicely with those products. So it has to interact with those products because, you know, some people will say, I have a, I have a great traceability system. I have this already. Yeah. Um, your ability to connect those together becomes the, the key value add there. Yeah, and, and I would like to add to that. Some of my experience from, from uh, working at uh, EMS is before, and I got uh, the corporate decision to, to implement the new system and all the headache about that. And I have to change all the methodologies and everything at the same time. Whenever a customer already have a, a installed traceability system or maintenance system or HR system, of course, the key thing for us is that we're able to integrate to it and, and in a simple way as well. Of course, when it was more complex integrations towards ERP as well, that requires a little bit more work, but in addition to that as well, we are developing the tools to allow the customer to strengthen and to do a lot of the integrations on their, on their own. And I, I have full respect for, for all the engineers out there that has, uh, has their system that they have coded themselves and they have the Excel sheets that are running the manufacturing uh, follow-ups on. But the but, uh, key thing here with that is that that by definition becomes very siloed, despite that we can share documents on, on Office 365 today. But we want the customer to be able to work with the same data to take relevant mm -hmm. decisions. So. Yeah, and to be able to look at data in different areas. And we talked earlier about that domain knowledge that you're bringing to the party from your decades of experience uh, and the domain knowledge in individual things and the ability to connect. But the customer has their own domain knowledge in terms of their, their industry, their product, the information they have around there. We've seen some more questions come in, but uh, we're running out of time. So anybody that has asked questions or has got more questions, you'll get an answer by email. What I wanted to do was just kind of summarize a little bit. 
um, just to say that there is absolutely a, an, an obvious connection between the performance of the factory and the performance of the business. We know that to be true. And, um, you know, we've, we've mentioned financial performance a lot, but I think it's as fundamental as being able to keep your customers, keep your customers happy, win new customers, and actually deliver for those customers in the way they want to. And we talked about data going outside the factory floor. One of the places that that data goes is to those, uh, to those customers. They want to see that data. And I think that's becoming an increasing demand from brands as they look to their outsource providers. Um, data and information, we've been good at collecting it, but we haven't been good at sharing it. It's ended up scattered in lots of silos in today's operating environment. So Embrain has the opportunity to do that. It has the opportunity to collect and correlate that data and share that data um, from all the different processes, all the different machines. And as you mentioned, up and down the, um, up and down the supply chain, up and down the product lifecycle value chain. Uh, and that's when the magic happens, when you start to bring all, stuff, all that stuff together. I just mentioned the uh, allowing manufacturers or brands to um, evolve the way they use their data. And I think that's really key. I, I, I feel bad when you see a software installation and it's like, well, you've got to change your system to meet our software. That shouldn't be the way it is. It should be something that can evolve and fit to your systems. And when, you're, when your systems change or your customer demands change or a traceability requirements change because the FDA have changed some rules. This software needs to be ready to uh, adapt to it. And you seem to have been able to take care of that. And, you know, the key is all about that, that idea of liberation, that data is there, uh, but by liberating it and contextualizing it, you can turn that into intelligence, you can turn that into insight, and you can turn that into real value for the business uh, and all the stakeholders, whether they're the uh, customers or, or the shareholders. Thank you so much, everybody, for asking asking all the questions and making it such an interesting interactive uh, process. I've I've really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Matthias. Anything to add before we before we wrap up from you guys? Well, thank you, Phil, and uh, we're looking forward for the future. And this is it is a very interesting time we're in, and I think it's up to us to cre create the future. So, yeah, okay. yeah, I, abs I absolutely agree. And, uh, you know, we're looking, I think we're looking to a, a period of really thoughtful innovation going forward. So I think uh, you've got an exciting solution for that. I would encourage anybody to get in touch with MTech uh, via their website or via one of these email addresses and, and chat to Todd and Matthias about how Embrain can be uh, applied specifically in their business and how it can, you know, fit within their, within their manufacturing and software ecosystem. Guys, thanks so much for your time. Thank you to everybody that's been watching with us today. Uh, look forward to next time we get together and chat and um, stay safe everybody and be well. Thank you. Yep. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.